on the face of it, spending around a thousand pounds or eleven hundred dollars on a gaming laptop that sports an RTX 3060 doesn't seem like they're the worst decision you could make, especially when that 3060 is paired with pretty much anything other than a quad-core CPU that's marketed as an i7, even in 2021. Yes, I'm still kinda mad about that, but it seems like a, a decent decision. But there are some quite key trade-offs that you'll be making if you end up going for this. So in this video, I want to make you aware of those trade-offs, the performance that this Acer Nitro 5 offers. So let's get started. First is the specs. Now, the model I have here is an AN515-45-R8CM, which seems to be slightly less available than the uh, R21A model, which uh, is slightly different in terms of its specs. Both of those models use a Ryzen 5 5600H, which is a 6-core, 12-thread CPU that boosts up to 4.2 GHz. They also use an RTX 3060 with 6 GB of VRAM uh, and a 95 watt max TDP. Uh, they both also have 512GB of NVMe storage and use the same, or at least as far as I'm aware, the same 1080p IPS 144Hz panel. The difference comes in their, their memory or RAM configurations where the model I have here only sports 8 gigabytes of DDR4-3200, whereas the R21A model sports 16. I should note that the RAM configuration I have here with the 8 gigabytes of total memory is in dual channel. So it's two 4 gigabyte sticks, which is good because it's running in dual channel. It's the, the best configuration for getting the most performance out of your CPU. Although the downside is that if you want to upgrade it, you have to replace both sticks rather than just adding a second one in. But I think that's a trade-off you could live with. Unfortunately, they have also gone with the cheaper option of the, the memory configuration, which is a single rank by 16 rather than single rank by 8, where by 8 uh, generally gives you better performance than by 16, and therefore by 16 is generally the cheaper option. So spec-wise, it looks okay. I mean, the RAM is a little bit uh, on the more budget side. And if you take a look at the 512 gig uh, WD SN530 SSD they use here, it's a bit of a weird configuration because it has, it does have a DRAM cache and it has the, the controller, but the only NAND flash module that's on there is right at the very back of the PCB. Like the furthest possible spot they could have put it from the DRAM and the controller. It doesn't really matter, it still performs fine, but I just thought that was a, an interesting design choice. Either way, this 5600H actually performs remarkably well, even despite that limitation. As in single-threaded results, and specifically with Cinebench R20, you're looking at the, this chip coming in at the lower end of the Ryzen 5000 series lineup, but still handily beating Intel's 11370H i7, and even the last gen 10750H, which is the sort of comparable six core CPU, at least from last gen. Swapping to multi-threaded does reveal the downside of only having six cores instead of eight for those sorts of CPU intensive tasks. In general, the, the eight core chips take a, a healthy lead, with the key exception of the 10875H, as thanks to the faster uh, single threaded performance of this 5600H, you actually get a little bit more performance than even the, that last gen eight core. Switching over to Blender though in the BMW scene, it's in a similar position, although uh, now the 10875H is able to exceed that, and it's only a couple of seconds faster than the 10750H, uh, thanks to Intel chips generally being more bursty and uh, more boost heavy in their workloads for that sort of shorter render. In longer workloads though, the gap between the Helios 300's 10750H and Nitro 5's 5600 is much wider, to the point where the 5600H is almost tying with the 8-core 10875H in the Concept D7 easel. In Premiere, the 8GB of RAM really, really hurts its score here, running over 20% lower than even the 10750H. 
The Puget Bench After Effects test refused to run as it requires 12 gigabytes of RAM at a minimum, so the Nitro 5 just has to get a zero here. And even in Photoshop, the low memory capacity meant it was diverting to the page file for a lot of the, the effects and tasks during this test, making it way, way slower. Interestingly though, power consumption was remarkably low. The stable under load power I recorded was around 44 watts, with the highest I saw only being 48 watts of total package power. Comparing those peak figures, that's less than half of what the 10750H uses to offer consistently less performance at least where RAM isn't a significant bottleneck. It's actually tied as one of the lowest power draw chips that I've tested, at least the non-ultra mobile ones. And what that means is that this thing generally runs relatively quiet, despite its pretty meager heatsink, at least for the CPU. And it does mean that the GPU generally has more thermal headroom to push for higher powers. And in general, it kind of does. While this is only a 95 watt TDP version, which is far from the highest, I think the highest I've seen is 130 or 135 watts, in games it actually does a really good job. Although I should make it clear with the benchmark results you're going to see in just a second, a number of these games have had potentially significant updates that have changed their performance since I was able to last run any of the benchmarks. The only, the only laptop that I've benchmarked at the same version and driver level is the ASUS Zephyrus M16, the one with the i9-11900H and the RTX 3070. So technically speaking, that is the only laptop you can directly compare to with uh, some of these results, although I'll still include the rest of the results so you can get a rough idea. With that said, in Watch Dogs Legion, the Nitro 5 really surprises, offering 60 FPS average at 1080p ultra settings, or only a couple of FPS behind the 11900H and 3070 in the M16. Again, take these results with a pinch of salt, but it's safe to say you get a pretty decent experience, or at least performance, out of this machine. Cyberpunk Ultra settings relies a lot on the CPU and memory, which, thanks to this RAM configuration, isn't brilliant, uh, and I suspect that a better setup uh, could offer much closer to the Helios 300's level of performance, although 45 FPS at ultra settings isn't actually all that bad, in Cyberpunk. As for CSGO, that's also a very CPU limited game and so the Nitro 5 does struggle here with this configuration. Although when I say struggle, what I mean is that it's about 10 FPS lower than anything else I've tested, but that's still 200 FPS average and if you drop that down to more like you know, medium or low settings you're easily going to be pushing 300 or more and so realistically that's plenty fine for this machine, but in terms of a direct comparison, it's slightly on the, the lower end. In Microsoft Flight, that is quite possibly the, the most obvious uh, game that's been updated to have potentially significantly better performance. As you can see, the Nitro 5 actually matches the 11900H and uh, RTX 3070 in the Zephyrus M16 here, at least in terms of its uh, performance mode results, which in theory it shouldn't, and so I suspect that there is some other bottleneck going on there, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, comparing to the other results, you can see quite a big delta between the two, and so I would expect if you were to rerun all of those results, you would see them being a lot higher, or at least a lot closer to the Nitro 5 and the M16. Finally, in Fortnite, the Nitro 5 runs in last place, at around 10 FPS slower than the Helios 300. That system does run a higher TDP version of the 3060 and generally has of higher end specs that also raise the price tag quite considerably, so for the money, there's not all that much of a performance difference and it's still 90 FPS average at ultra settings, so again, not too much to complain about. So it's not gonna set your world on fire with its in-game performance, but it's certainly good enough, especially for the money. So what's the catch then? Well, unfortunately, that's possibly one of the biggest trade-offs Acer seem to have made here, which is the display. 
Well, yes, this is a 1080p IPS 144Hz panel, just as the sticker says. It doesn't really matter how many frames it can draw if it doesn't actually draw them in any reasonable amount of time. A new frame can be drawn in roughly 5 milliseconds, depending on the transition, but having old frames go away, well, as the UFO test can show you, there's between 3 and 5 legible copies or frames on screen, barring the most recent one, which is pretty abysmal. I mean, at 144 hertz, having 4 frames on screen is almost 30 milliseconds. Like, 30 milliseconds for one frame to just go away, to be undrawn and have a full transition, that's a pretty significant time period, uh, to the point where it really does affect the gaming experience. While playing on this, well, even compared to uh, any other laptop that I've tested with a, the same 15-inch screen size, this was significantly harder to hit shots, to, to aim correctly, because you would be seeing two, three, four copies of your enemy potentially very far apart, depending on how quickly you're moving around, and it makes for a, a less than ideal gaming experience. If you play less fast-paced games, it's obviously not quite as bad as, generally speaking, the more motion you have, the more obvious that sort of ghosting is, but it still isn't fantastic and really detracts from the gaming experience where the performance should be letting it shine. Add to that the brightness, which is only around 250 nits, is, makes it okay for you know things like indoor use and, well, in general, but even to me, especially in this relatively well-lit room, it's fairly dim, and you might be able to see that in some of the clips on screen as well. It just doesn't look quite as bright and as vibrant as, well, a number of other models that I've tested. But honestly, the biggest kicker for all of this is that this panel only covers 64% of the sRGB spectrum while testing with my Spider X. I know that sounds like a bigger deal for content creators, and it definitely is. If you wanted to do any level of video or photo editing, 3D modeling, or even games development, this laptop is no longer suitable because you cannot have any level of accuracy in what colors are being displayed on this as to what is being displayed in real life or captured with cameras. That's a pretty big deal, but even for just watching stuff like YouTube videos or playing games, there is a pretty significant difference in what you see in real life and then what you see on this screen versus any other display. Even the contrast is pretty significant in terms of how minimal it is here versus any other display I've tested. And I should make it clear that a display very much like this one was one of the main things that I disliked about MSI's Bravo 15. Now, luckily the input lag isn't as bad. Registering an average of 36.65 milliseconds and a relatively consistent run, barring that first shot up at 88 or something milliseconds, so not too bad across the board. One interesting thing is that while the display latency was fine, I did have a bit of a bug with the audio latency where uh, basically the audio would be delayed anywhere between about 100 milliseconds and, well, more like a full second, to the point where I had to connect Bluetooth headphones to see if it was, you know, the system or, or whatever, and they were fine. My suspicion is that it's part of the NitroSense app that comes pre-installed on the machine, and it has Acer's True Harmony audio mixer or whatever feature built in, and by default it seems to have been set to music rather than auto or game mode, and so by switching it back to auto or game mode I seem to have resolved it, so if you have any audio latency issues with a Nitro 5, maybe check that setting. Lastly, let me give you a quick fire rundown of the other things I haven't mentioned, like the battery life, which uh, thanks to the 57.5 kilowatt hour cell is okay. It's decent enough. I think you'll probably get four or five hours of sort of web browsing use, but gaming is going to be pretty minimal. The DC adapter obviously works fine, but at least on my model, 
uh, uh, when I plugged it in initially was uh, you know, felt normal but wasn't charging the laptop and I had to physically click it into place. Have a listen. But once it's clicked in, that worked okay. So uh, if you happen to have one of these and you plug in your AC adapter and it doesn't start charging, try pushing it in just a little bit more. In terms of the rest of the I.O., you have three USB type A, uh, USB 3 ports, as well as a type C port, HDMI, a 4 Pro headphone jack, and uh, an Ethernet port. Although sadly no SD card reader, but we've already established this isn't a machine for creators, so that's probably not a big deal. The keyboard is fine. Actually, I do quite like typing on this. It has a slight tactile bump while still being relatively soft and light, so that's good. Plays or, or games well. Uh, also, the trackpad has really good uh, palm rejection. Uh, technically, the keyboard is uh, backlit, although I say technically because it's not the brightest, and so you might struggle to see it. Uh, and there, there's also a setting in NitroSense where it turns the backlight off after 30 seconds, and it seems to reset that setting quite frequently, frequently, so you might not end up seeing the backlight until you're actually typing anyway. Inside the machine, you'll find not only upgradable SODIMM RAM modules, but also a spare M.2 slot and an empty 2.5 inch bay. Some models will come with either of these pre-populated or uh, just, you know, empty like this, but it's pretty nice that you can not only easily upgrade your RAM, which honestly, if you buy this 8 gigabyte model, I recommend you do go get a 16 gigabyte dual channel one rank by eight kit. And I think you'll be unlocking some extra performance with this machine. But you can also throw in an extra M.2 SSD and even a two and a half inch drive, like a two and a half inch SSD, for example, and expand that storage as you need to. For me, it's a real shame that Acer cheaps out on the panel. I can forgive the RAM, especially because you can just go and buy a model that doesn't have this configuration. And even if you do, well, you're saving some money so you can just go swap out those RAM modules yourself later. But the display isn't something that you, the end user, can easily go and swap out. It takes this from being a fantastic option that I can highly recommend, especially for this price tag, to something that honestly doesn't really make sense as a machine because it's kind of too slow for gaming and it's also not even color accurate or even just can't even display the most basic spectra or color space uh, with even more than two thirds of that color space and so it's not good for a designer so it just that doesn't really make sense to me and on top of that there are a number of other options like the Lenovo Legion 5 which offers a very similar spec in fact it actually offers a 130 watt TDP version of the 3060 and a 5800H and 16 gigabytes of RAM and it has a display that's both brighter, it covers um, just shy of 100% of the sRGB spectrum, and there's even 165 hertz instead of 144, all for very similar money. If Acer had opted for even a just slightly better panel, one that was just a hair faster and a little bit more, uh, well, vibrant, this would be a, a, an easy recommendation. The hardware itself offers a pretty good performance and of course the upgradability is a very nice touch and the, the overall sort of you know fit and finish is okay it's certainly a budget machine but you would get by with it fine it's just that that display that panel um, very much detracts from the the final value proposition and so um, yeah it's a uh, difficult one for me to recommend. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the Nitro 5? Is it a machine you'd pick up yourself, or would you go with something like the Legion 5 instead, or maybe something else entirely? Feel free to let me know in those comments, and of course if you have any questions, leave those down there too. If you want to pick up the Nitro 5, or probably more likely check out pricing when and when you watch this, do take a look at that top link in the description down below. That's an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see all of that good stuff. If you want to see more videos like this one and be notified when they come out, then do hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. If you want to support the channel, you can do that directly with the YouTube join button where you get access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and some cool emojis to use in the comments 
and on our weekly live streams. Or you can support on Patreon instead if you prefer, or less directly by buying merch for hoodies or t-shirts like this one, or a load of other cool designs that I designed myself. Uh, or you can even do it even more indirectly by using the other affiliate links they're in the description for places like Overclock GK if you're buying from there, VPN options, Humblebun, No Streamlabs, OBS, and a whole lot of other stuff, so do feel, feel free to check it out. There'll be plenty of other reviews on the end card you can take a look at, so please do keep watching. Otherwise, thank you for watching. We'll see you all in the next video.